Hello and welcome to this video on the ICND1 series. In this video, we're going to continue from where we stopped and we're going to try to configure OSPF on the command line. So we're going to look at how to configure OSPF. We're also going to look at the passive interface command. So right now I'm connected to R1 and R1 has two networks. I can do show IP route to see two networks. Do show IP route and we can see that R1 is connected to 192.168.12.0 and 192.168.1.0. Let's try to ping R2, which is 192.168.12.1. And we have connectivity to R2. Now, what I want to do is that I want to turn on OSPF on R1. And the way to do that is to use a router command that would say router OSPF. And the process ID, we just give it as one. So router OSPF one. Now we're in the OSPF configuration mode. And the next thing we want to do is to put in the interfaces to run OSPF. And the way we do that is with the network command. So we will say network. Again, we can use 192.168.0.0 to get both interfaces into OSPF, or we can deal one by one, which is the more advisable method. So we can just say 192.168.12.1, and then the wildcard mask would be uh, 0.0.0.0. .0 and we're going to put it in area 0. And we're going to do the same thing for the 1.1 interface and put it in area 0. And pretty much that's all we need to configure OSPF. The next thing we want to do is to set up the only one fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 to run OSPF. And the way we're going to do that is I will have to turn on passive interface on the other interfaces or to use what is called the passive interface uh, default command. So we can say passive interface and instead of saying interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0, something like that, or fast Ethernet 0 slash 1, in this case, what we would do is we are going to say passive interface for all the interfaces. And the way to do that is say passive interface default. And that means that we are suppressing routing updates on all interfaces. So we're going to do that. So passive interface default. And of course, it's going to affect fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 too. So what we can do is just say no passive interface, fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. And with this command, we will know that hellos will only be sent out fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. And so what that means is it's only on this network you can have OSPF neighbor for R1, but with the network's command, it's also going to advise this network. It's also going to advise the 192.168.1.0 network. So the next thing we're going to do is to hop onto R2 and give uh, the same configuration. So we have R2 here. First, we're going to go into the uh, OSPF, and the way to do that is to type router OSPF1. And again, we are in the config mode. Uh, now, what we can do, the same thing. So we put network command 192.168.12.2, and the wildcard mask would be 0.0.0.0, .0 and it will be area 0. And remember, we do this, we will see that OSPF neighbor relationships will come up, and there we go. We can see that it says OSPF adjacency for process 1, and the neighbor is 192.168.1.1. And it has gone from loading to full. So when the OSPF neighbor relationship is trying to form, it goes through many states, and the last state is that it goes to is a full state. So we can see loading to full here. Now, the next thing we want to do is put the other interface. So we are going to say network 192.168.2.1, which is the IP address. The wildcard mask will still be 0.0.0.0, .0 and it's going to be in area 0. Now, we do show IP interface brief. We can see that. This is 2.1, and it's fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. So fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 is connected to another network. And since we don't want to form neighbor relationships on that network, we have to disable the OSPF hellos. And we can do that by saying passive interface, fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. And once we do that, there will be no more hellos on that interface. So even if somebody comes to plug in your router and configure it, the OSPF neighbor relationships will still not form. Now let's check if we were getting the route. So we would exit and do a show IP route. So let's exit with control Z. There is a show IP route. And sure enough, yeah, sure enough, we can find the network connected to R1, which is the not 192.168.1.0 slash 24 network. And it also shows 110 slash 1 slash 11. What that means is that 110 is the administrative distance of OSPF and 11 uh, is the metric for OSPF. So 
As far as Router 2 is concerned, the metric to reach this network would be 11. So we get another route with a better metric, i.e. lower metric. Well, we're going to prefer that route and install it uh, in the routing table instead of this route. Now let's test and see if we can reach the Router 1 network from a computer that is connected to Router 2. So I have this computer here. And I can try to ping default gateway, which is 192.168.2.1, which is router 2. Now I'm going to try to ping 192.168.1.1, and I have replies from 192.168.1.1. And the way I can be sure that it's going to router 3 is that I can use what's called the trace route command. And it's trace RT in Windows, and I'll trace to 192.168.1.1. But but if you use a trace route command, you can use the dash D keyword to tell it not to resolve anything, and it's going to be really fast. So we can see that it first goes to 192.168.2.1. It says trace complete, and it goes to router 2 before it gets to interface. And this is the interface of router 1. So it goes to router 2 before it gets to router 1. So what we're going to do right now is to look at some OSPF commands to verify OSPF. And the first one we want to look at is the show IP OSPF neighbor. So we have show IP OSPF neighbor. So this is just to show the state of the neighborhood relationship. And here we have 192.168.1.1. Why do we have 192.168.1.1 and 192.168.12.1? This is because of something called the router ID. The neighbor ID is the router ID of the router. And in this case, I've configured 192.168.1.1 as what is called a loopback interface. Now, a loopback interface is an interface that's always up and never down. So it's like a virtual interface that you just set up, and you can use it for testing purposes and things like that. So we go back to R1 and do show IP interface brief. We get to see that the 192.168.1.0 network is not an actual network. It's just a loopback interface. And if you go into the interface, do show interface loopback 0, you get to see that it's a loopback interface. And it pretty much has characteristics like any physical interface, except that it's always uh, going to be up. In fact, by default, you don't need to do any, you don't need to do a no shutdown for a loopback because it's always up. So the reason why R1 is choosing 192.168.1.1 as its router ID is because the OSPF router ID selection process is a three-step process. So in the OSPF router ID selection, you can configure the router ID, and it's always going to use the router ID, uh, or it could use the highest loopback address. And of course, the reason it uses the loopback address uh, over physical address is because loopbacks never go down, so they are more reliable interfaces. And the last one is that it can use the highest physical IP address. So in this case, router 1 is chosen 192.168.1.1 because it's actually a loopback interface. So this is the 192.168.1.1, and it's a loopback interface. So router 1 has chosen it as router ID instead of 192.168.12.1. Even though the IP address is 192.168.12.1, it's actually higher than 192.168.1.1. So that's why that's the router ID. So we do show IP OSPF neighbor. So we can see that for R2, the neighbor ID is 192.168.12.2 because there's no loopback interface in R2. And it just shows the highest physical IP address, which is 192.168.12.2 for this interface, fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. The other interface, 192.168.2.1, and that IP address is lower than 192.168.12.2. So that's how OSPF selects the router ID. Another command you want to know is the OSPF interface command. So just come out and say show IP OSPF interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0, for instance, and here we can see the interface is running OSPF and the parameters. This is where we see most of the parameters that are used for the hellos. For instance, we know that, okay, this is the IP address of the interface, which must match, like the network must match. Also, the area must match. This is the area 0. We can see the process ID. This doesn't have to match for neighbor relationships to form. This is the router ID. Uh, which is 192.168.1.1, even though the IP address is 192.168.12.1 because that's a loopback. The network type is what's called a broadcast. OSPF network types are not part of the ICND1 syllabus, but we can also see that the cost is 10. The way OSPF calculates the cost is that it uses the bandwidth. So 
it just does 10 raised to the power of 8 divided by the bandwidth. So if we check show interface fast using that 0 slash 0, we can see that the interface is running at half duplex and at 10 megabits per second. So what OSPF just does is that based on this bandwidth, 10 megabits per second, it does 10 raised to the power of 8, so which is 10 raised to the power of 8 divided by 10 uh, megabit. And 10 megabit is, that's 10 raised to the power of 8 divided by 10 raised to the power of 7 because 10 megabits is 10 times. Mega is 10 raised to power 6, so 10 raised to power 7. And that's how 10, that's how it gets to this cost. So if you have a link that is 100 megs, it should be raised to the power of 8 divided by 100 megs. Then the cost is going to be... One, so that's the way OSPF calculates its bandwidth. So OSPF just does 10 raised to the power of eight divided by a bandwidth, and that's because when OSPF was designed, fast Ethernet interfaces were considered as very fast interfaces, and so the limit was set as 10 raised to the power of eight. So if we go back to the IP OSPF interface, another parameter that we need to see is the hello timer and the dead timer. Here we can see that hello timer is 10 and dead timer is 40. The dead timer is always uh, four times the hello timer. And because it's on the Ethernet interface, the hello timer is by default 10. You can always change timers, or by default it's 10. And it's a dead timer is 40. We can also see that it's adjacent with the 192.168.12.2 network, which is R2. And so we can see that OSPF is functioning properly. So if we do show IP route OSPF, we can see only the OSPF routes and that's the 192.168.2.0 route. And we can see that the router has selected the next hop interface, which is 192.168.12.2, and it's also selected the exit interface, which is fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. So right now we have OSPF working, and that's what it takes to configure OSPF. So in this video, we have been able to look at how to configure OSPF. We looked at the passive interface command, and we've been able to look at other commands that we can use to verify OSPF. Thank you very much for watching.